Welcome, 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 everyone. We are back for another session of the Community Justice Forum here at New Harlem, which is wherever I am, wherever you are, wherever the spirit is alive. <laughs> We're all in different places, uh, but I'm physically coming at you from the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Chippewa, and Mississaugas of New Credit. Um, we are aware that when we do this work digitally, that our um, seemingly ephemeral existence materially affects communities, um, not only where we are, but where all of our tubes and wires and um, byproducts are as well. And um, I guess just want to stay constantly aware of mitigating our impact in all of the ways. Um, someone once uh, spoke to me about the, the idea of the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant. Um, as a covenant of mutual care um, that includes like the the land and the animals and the resources and that we are also among those animals. And so um, that those principles include how we care for others. Um, and someone else very wise who was my mother once said to me, how can you do anything for anyone if you deplete yourself until you are dead? Um, and so while I don't love some of the seemingly self-serving self-care rhetoric um, <laughs> that can be about buying yourself stuff and nothing else, I do think there's something important in thinking about the ways that we fortify ourselves in order to enable acts of service to the community and um, the land and um, our, our principles and priorities, that thing that is driving us, we need to also be fueled. And that's part of what we're talking about today. And that's why I said all of that. I'm Donna Michelle St. Bernard. And today's session is titled Sustaining Self. Um, the Community Justice Forum, the Community Justice Forum uh, is a um, public engaged vehicle that we are using as a way to um, uh, explore and evolve ideas around acts of creation and around the stories that we're telling uh, that includes more voices in the conversation and helps us to have um, broader perspectives around what it is, what it means, what it do. A lot of good full sentences of Blackness for you. <laughs> um, things I want to say before we jump in. Um, we are supported today by uh, ASL interpreters, Marcia Adolf and Kimberly Johnson. We're very grateful for that. If you're joining us on YouTube, there's a CC button at the bottom of the frame that you can click to get live captioning. It is imperfect, but aren't we all? I also want to thank Max C. Farron and Heather Bellingham for their support of this event backstage today, without which we would be each just talking to our windows. Thanks. Thanks, Internet. Thanks, Al Gore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you always got to credit back generations. For now. <laughs> it's a, right? It's a practice. Okay. So today, as you can see, I am joined by two awesome, awesome guests. Uh, Travis Knights is a dancer, choreographer, and speaker who you may know from being famous, but specifically uh, recently from Ephemeral Artifact and from the Tap Love Tour podcast. If that's not why you know Travis, then you just better head over there. Not now, we're doing something later. And Leah Simone Bowen, who is a playwright, director, and podcaster, um, who you will have probably recently had in your ear with Secret Life of Canada and the podcast playlist. Um, and more to come, more to come. Again, just hold your horses. We'll drop all these links later. Like, just be with us, be present in the moment. Hi, all. Hi. Oh, that the buddy ran down. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting us. How you doing? <laughs> so awesome. You know, it comes and goes. <laughs> it's pretty good right now. I'm so like thrilled that you all are here. I have to, I have to, I have to like say something like right off the bat. Like I, I, so the, uh, uh, the way I organize myself is like I roll over um, when the alarm clock hits and I, and I like look down at the, the, the to-do list, you know, the, on the calendar. And I saw this on the calendar and it said uh, sustaining self. And I laughed and I <laughs> laughed. And <laughs> Uh, so like, I, I guess I come, I come in like with, uh, maybe it's a confession or like, I don't know, like, um, 
I'm very much on a learning curve. You know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, I guess to be full, fully transparent, I come here absolutely selfishly because um, sustaining self is something that I really need to learn. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I want to say ditto to everything that Travis <laughs> just said. Um, except my laughing was more of a laugh cry and, <laughs> and wondering if I should just email you and go, look, I don't really know anything about this subject. I, I, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I think we're all, I, I think it's like, okay, I'm going to start off. Yes. With a quote by Maya Angelou. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Let's go. But it's honestly because one time I saw her in person and she was talking about religion and being a Christian. And she said that often people come up to her and say, I'm a Christian. And she said she would always say already because her idea was that it was a lifelong journey to get to be a Christian or you know, fill in the blank. And so I thought of that today because I think it's the same thing with trying to figure out how to sustain oneself during these times. Like it's not, I don't know if there's anyone out there that's saying that they actually have reached the pinnacle and know how to properly do a work life, artistic career balance in these times right now um they're a very confident person and maybe they have but basically what i'm saying is everyone else who has told you that they can do it are liars mm, mm, mm -hmm. i was i was going i was i wanted to start off positive but <laughs> you said you didn't know down. anything and then you came with the facts <laughs> Yeah, so that's um, how I'm gonna. But yeah, you know, I like I'm I, I don't I, I'm definitely not trying to contradict, but I I do believe that there are people out there that have pieces to the puzzle, you know. Um, of course, that's what's yes. on my head, yeah. Of course, I think uh, Donna, when you you were talking in the intro, you said something about oh self care. It was something about self care and consumerism, maybe or. Mm -hmm. buying your way to self-care mm -hmm. and I think those are the kind of things that I think um can be really harmful or perhaps give people the idea that there's it's not pieces that we're putting together to create a whole it's it's just one piece it's the mm -hmm. if you can get the this new day planner I mean I'm a day planner person I'm like if I can just get one of those, you know, they have those like every minute of the day timers where you're supposed to like, I was like, I'm going to get one of those. And then I bought another planner and another planner. And I realized it's, there's no planner that is going to help me. <laughs> there's no planner. I resonate with that in context of festival schedules. I feel like one day, I'll open a festival program and they will laid it, have laid it out in such a way that I actually know when and where shows are. And that <laughs> when that festival program is made, I will be able to see all the shows. I hate festival programs. Those things are mazes to get through. Impenetrable. Yeah. yeah. One of many stressors in our life <laughs> is the festival program. Mm. Um. I, I love everything that you're both saying because I feel like that's very much in the spirit of like of what the forum wants to do, which is to figure it out together. And um, I mean, to even just say like, this is not easy <laughs> and here are some ways. And so I'm going to share the provocation that I sent to both of you mm -hmm. when I asked you to be on this panel. And I want, I also want you to know that I also laughed while typing. I'm like, <laughs> we're going to talk about, <laughs> they'll tell me. <laughs> but, um, sorry, just rewind. Travis, did you just say that you roll over and immediately look at a list of things you need to do in the day? 
Yeah, because yeah, because I'm like I'm I'm uh, sharper in the morning, and so I'll yeah. likely schedule something in the morning. So I have to be hip to what's going on. Oh, that's wild. Absolutely, it's probably not healthy, but I don't know. You probably have to give fewer apologies than I. Let me maybe take a note of that <laughs> technique. Thanks. Um, okay, so the original provocation that we will stray from uh, shortly is who or what is the greatest threat to your peace? And what are you doing about it? <laughs> the second part was a threat for sure. Uh, Travis, what, why don't you kick us off? What did you, what came to your mind when that? So there's up? this uh, dream um, that was re really like impactful for me. Like uh, I think I had it last month and um, uh, I was in a house and like whenever I went from to a different room, it would be a, a different house. And I was interacting in, in different contexts with different people in my life. And lo and behold, there's like this skunk. And the skunk was doing what a skunk does, threatening. <laughs> and so I was like running from room to room trying to get away from the skunk. And the skunk was just like, ah, oh, oh. just, you know, probably not even. The skunk was just chilling, being a skunk, doing its thing. And, um, you know. I woke up and, and as you do, when you wake up from dreams, you forget. But I remembered the skunk. And within uh, a day and then a week, and then the next week, I just kept on getting um, these uh, provocations from the outside world about skunks. Uh, I'm in this artistic process with um, this wonderful South African gumbo dancer named Mafa. And, uh, um, He's been generous in terms of uh, uh, getting me hip to his South African culture, um, shamanistic uh, um, rituals, understandings. And, and in that um, paradigm, uh, the skunk is revered because um, it, it is said that bad spirits are, are repelled from the smell of skunks. And so you'll, <clears throat> you'll see like uh, skunk imagery um, specifically uh, in that culture, but not only in that culture. Ha ha, hi. Currently, uh, as you can tell perhaps by this lovely lamp, I'm in uh, a stranger's home, lovely woman, her name's Shannon. Uh, I'm visiting here. Um, I'm in... Um, Edmonton, Alberta, uh, filming a documentary about this tap dancer, phenomenal tap dancer named uh, Jonathan Morin. Jonathan's uh, an indigenous uh, tap dancer. And um, the, the whole point of the, the documentary is to um, juxtapose what tap dance is if culture is removed from it, right? So tap dance is an African-American um, output uh, but you wouldn't necessarily know that today. And so I'm juxtaposing that with Jonathan Morin's story um, as an indigenous person who didn't have access to indigenous culture. And so I'm, I'm here in Jonathan's hometown to um, uh, witness him introducing himself essentially to his indigenous culture and juxtaposing that with, with uh, what tap dance is and could be if it's connected culturally. I say that to say that um, in um, one of the teachings, uh, uh, Jonathan's Cree, um, they also uh, revere skunks in, in a very specific and pointed way. Um, and so uh, this is a long story to answer the question that the, I think, fear, no, that the, the biggest uh, impediment or threat to uh, my own personal sustainability is myself. Um, I wonder about my dream. Was I embodying the negative spirit, a bad spirit? You know what I mean? Is the skunk trying to protect the self from myself? Um, the I've noticed in my life that um, there's been... Uh, points of self-sabotage, points of delusion. Um, um, my mother raised me, you know, saying like, just, hey, you, you get out, get out of your own way. Stop thinking so. It's like, 
I, um, it's me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, a... Okay, so the first thing I want to say is I want to go first after every question so that I don't <gasps> fall. <laughs> That's a dark that was, <laughs> that was really good. Um, <clears throat> and the second thing I want to say is that um, knowing that that lamp behind you which is from a Christmas story, isn't yours. Because as you were talking, I was like, who is this person? <laughs> <laughs> Very specific lamp purchase. Anyway, that's, yeah. that is not the question that you asked, but I just had to say that because it's a great lamp. Um, so when I originally got thought of the question of, of who, who or what is the, the greatest threat to my piece, I instinctively said myself, um, because we, I think many people feel like they're their own worst enemy. You know, I, I've already spoken about the day planner, so I think you can um, draw a lot from that. But the more I think about it And think about the things that I worry about, because I think it's about worry and I think it's about stress. I no longer blame myself. I blame late stage capitalism. Damn. I blame the time that we're in. Because, as we all know, we're all in a place where the majority of us are no longer going to be able to perhaps achieve the, the things in life we thought were inevitable. And that's, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but those are the things that keep me up at night. Like, and those are the things that disquiet me the most because I keep thinking, well, maybe there is a way to achieve a, a place in my later years, in my 80s and 90s, that I will be completely well taken care of and we'll have a social system that will you know, X, Y, and Z. Maybe there is a way that I can still live in a area where there are trees. Because I live, I live like very downtown Toronto. I know it's so depressing, but I live in an area that doesn't have a lot of trees and they, they keep cutting down the trees. The trees that we do have, they keep cutting down the trees. And so that's who I blame. That's what I blame. Um, I blame capitalism because it, it links back to everything. It links back to um, white supremacy. It links back to just all of it. But saying all of that is quite depressing. And does it depress me? Yes, it does. One thing that does give me hope is um, I had to read a book. I did not choose to read this book. So in case you think I'm very pretentious, I actually had to read it for work. So, um, but it, it's a book called How to Live at the End of the World, which also sounds very depressing, um, but it is not. It's essentially, um, the, the author is Travis Holloway and it goes through theory he talks about theory, art, and politics, those three things at this point that we're in, which he calls the end of the world, but it's not about that everything's going to necessarily fall apart. It's that everything 
might be changing in a way that we can no longer ignore each other, that we can, we're, we're getting to a point that even the very rich will understand that they're living in a community of others. Like there's not going to be any place that you can go to, to get away from what's happening. And that will actually provide us as humans and as, and the animal world, because he talks about the animal world a lot, that the entire planet will have to work together in a way that we've never done before. And that it will, it will break open this new, new era. Will there be a lot of terrible things? Probably, but that, that on our way to getting there, probably, but it gave me hope because that is, that is the thing that, that upsets me the most about this time is that I feel like in a lot of different ways, just because of the way things are, we're moving apart, right? Like politically, uh, emotionally, uh, through, through all different ways. And that it's, um, that it's possible that these things that seem very dark right now will, will actually provide us a way to come back together like we'll be forced to do it and so that's very exciting but yeah late stage capitalism (laughs) that's the thing even your optimism has a darkness (laughs) (laughs) i tried i was like i'm gonna bring it up to hope at the end but just you know (laughs) i think if if i can if i can just like add um i think it's important in what you just said to uh, be very clear about the we. There's this story that uh, when you say we, like who are you talking about specifically? <clears throat> the um, there's this story that just like ha- I absolutely believe, but it has me. Whoa! Um, so some scientists they um, um, go to the Amazon and engage in a, um, an ayahuasca an ayahuasca ceremony. And for those of you who know anything about it. You have to you have to mix two separate plants in a very specific way to get this conco- concoction to to work, and uh, you know the the ceremony has is responsible for many 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 people across many generations. Um, uh, there, it, it opens up your mind. You you learn insights through the experience. This uh, um, shamanic psychedelic uh, experience. And so the scientists doing what scientists do, they ask the question, well, how did you, let me be wrong. How did you primitive people know to get this bark and mix it with this leaf way over there? How, how did you, and uh, the, sh- uh, the shaman said, uh, uh, the trees told us. Full face honesty. Um, so, I've, so, meaning that there there are cultures to this day that have maintained their connection to the land, maintained their connection to nature, um, animals, um, everything. Uh, it's so going back to what you said, late stage capitalism. This culture specifically has has done the uh, the complete opposite. Um, so yeah, I I agree with you. I think I think it also has me because I agree with you. It has me stepping deep into my hippie bag. I'm like looking for the ones that I can like go off into my own little corner somewhere and, and form a commune so we can just live together. Uh, yeah, and that's actually it's funny because I feel the same way. Like I, I'm always slightly on the side of okay, I need to be. I need to learn. Like one of the things that I'm going to admit this, this is what I did during the pandemic. I did not plan to do this. I watched Survivor. Mm. I had not really ever seen Survivor before. Like I I think I had seen the very first one. And then years later, I was like, why are people still watching this show? (laughs) Um. I ended up watching almost every season of Survivor during the pandemic, like back to back, like in those dark days where you couldn't go anywhere. And it taught me a lot about um, American imperialism. 
uh, because mostly for the first couple seasons, it's all white people and they all cry when they miss a meal and they're like, I understand. It's so hard. <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's set on an island where they'll tell you where it is, but you never see the people from that place. Mm. They use the the language of the people, but never translate it. So it's like, you're the, you know, this tribe and you're the, this tribe, but we don't. Right. Hmm. And it, it really came out of a place of like, Oh, I'm going to watch this because I should learn how to make a fire in case, you know, in case this pandemic gets real out of control and we turn into kind of a zombie landscape i need to run and make fire in the woods but what it ended up really teaching me was more about i mean i I wasn't surprised to learn this about america but it is it is watching it is about watching american idealism and imperialism because it's really about landing in a place where there are no people, even though there are probably people like right around the corner that have been there for centuries and um, imposing a ideas of what um, lack really is like what they consider to be lack. And Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't even know why I started talking about Survivor, you guys. But um, here we are. I will watch Survivor. I think we were talking about, oh, about running away off into the woods and like, yeah. and, like trying to create a commune. But but yeah, so th- that book that I mentioned, that's what he talks about is like, not only are the billionaires trying to, you know, blast into space to get away, but lots of people are trying to come up with like the bunker idea or like, we're going to, how can we isolate ourselves into this kind of perfect place that won't be affected by this thing. And the, the, the terrifying, but also I found it really hopeful news is that you, you can't, you can't, everyone will be affected and everyone and everyone from the very poor to the very rich and all the, the in-betweens will be affected and um and yeah so i don't know as artists then it makes me i I, for years i think for years have felt very cynical about art making i went through those years of like what is the point of Mm. you know but I feel like it is more and more necessary. Like it will be the thing. It is the thing, you know? And we saw that during this time that we are going through and just, what did people turn to? It wasn't, it wasn't anything else other than art. Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about that um, survivor model and like the story of it, right? The story of it is there is not enough for you to have, I must not have. Mm. Uh, We got to get some of these people out of here. It's a competition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and And we're not strategizing, like we need to have a strong community. So here's who needs to be in it. We're strategizing how to get people out in the right order so that I am the only one left and only I eat and only I am dry when it rains. Because, you know, of course those shows are not unaware of the other people living on that island. They physically moved them to have that site and then called them to provide catering. So they're definitely aware (laughs) of those people over there who live here all the time and are not starving. That's part of it is their cosplaying need, as you say. Um, and it, but that's the that is the story of that show, and that is the story of so many shows now because it's such a replicable pattern for TV, for commerce, for late stage capitalism to keep replicating this. There can only be one narrative, and so like there's all go. 
No, which I was going to say, which is even more fascinating that we've become very enamored in popular culture with competitions and one person, you know, mm-hmm. one person rises to the top. There can only be one because I read that Darwin never ever uttered the phrase uh, survival of the fittest. (laughs) He never said that. He talked about evolution Mm -hmm. and he talked about that things, creatures evolve. It doesn't necessarily mean the strongest no, it means the most useful evolved. traits will persist in your genetic line. It actually means the the organism or the animal or the human that can adapt mm-hmm. survives. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But that has been reinterpreted and and remixed as survival of the fittest. The the muscle man wins or whatever you know we like to to but, interpret um, it. adapt adaptability is key to survival doesn't fit on a mug leah so think (laughs) use your brain right 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 yeah it's just about adapting it's really just about adapting yes yes which which we are all experts at now (laughs) can i say might be the key to sustaining oneself Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah i Liam think, I think the there's first a, a, lap. <laughs> <laughs> i think there's like a, a real a real uh fear you know when it comes to the idea of of change um uh, i'll have to you know adapting requires requires you to um be present and accept new information I think it's important um, that we, if we are to, if we are to accept the notion of a we, mm-hmm. uh, I think it's important that uh, we realize and accept that there are certain um, people among us who have already been through their own apocalypse, peoples that have already been through their own apocalypse. People are living in a post-apocalyptic world mm-hmm. called, in their case, late-stage capitalism. Um, and so for them, the idea of change is different. The idea of revolution isn't as scary as someone that's comfortable or someone that would um, apply to um, be on Survivor would, would think that's very scary. Um, and so, I don't know, when, when you talk about art, the, the, the art making, the reason why the, the topic of um, self-sustaining uh, is so important is because I really do feel a responsibility to add something uh, useful to the conversation uh, because if I don't do it I'm slowly I'm I'm a late, I'm a late bloomer but I do I do get there eventually but I'm, I'm slowly learning that if I don't do it it won't get done mm-hmm. you know what I mean um, and perhaps um, if the time is right and the wind is at our back, we can create something that can inspire our next um, phase in evolution. Hopefully we can enjoy this this otherworldly experience of life that we didn't know was possible, Uh, but it takes change, it takes courage, um, it takes wisdom to sustain self uh, long enough to to get there, Mm -hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. It does, and it takes someone to reach for something that is not immediately visible. I think there are many yeah. engines of despair and engines of doubt, sort of aimed at aimed at the dreaming. And I always try to remember like things that are commonplace for us now that didn't exist until someone was like, "Okay, pretend, pretend there was a box and you pressed buttons and then your food was hot. Pretend." And then someone was like, pretend what? Give me a <laughs> screwdriver. <laughs> Donna needs a microwave. <laughs> mm-hmm. So like there's so so many things that had to be imagined. Well, I mean, all the things had to be imagined into existence. And so I think that that's maybe part of 
something something that I f- find sustain, sustaining in a purposefully hopeful practice. Like, you know, my work talks about not fun stuff in the world and um, the, all the best influences on my uh, artistic work are like, oh, but what if anybody survived <laughs> in this? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Try it. Um, that that forces me to go past what I see and then the sort of doom doom spiral of like if we go on like this this is where we're going but that's actually easy to see Mm. and the work that is harder and therefore more worthy to do is if this doesn't go on like this what does what is that and what needs to be disrupted for this not to go on like this all of this is a scary question it, yeah i also find it really helpful to remind myself of all of the people who've come before mm-hmm. like all of the people like you're saying like the people who <laughs> sure invented the microwave but also <laughs> the people who <laughs> bless them you know <laughs> disrupted who who transformed who made better you know all of the all of the things that we we treasure and enjoy right now like all of the and as I say we I mean in the context of us here on this land right now in this zoom right but um it it helps to to remind myself like I'm not I'm personally probably not inventing something Mm -hmm. that it has been invented. The, the path maybe has not just been cut yet to allow it to bloom. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm a path cutter. I'm not the inventor. And that's helpful for me because I feel like there's support all around, like, that invisible support of the ones who have come before. It's nice. A path cutter. Some nice humility in it. I love it. Like making it possible to see what, what is already there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I enjoy that. Because that is so often, um, that's I think part of, part of the anxiety. There are so many anxieties of which in a moment, I'll name a few. Um, but one of them for sure one of them in an ethical practice is like am I standing in front of somebody Um, or am I standing on on somebody's you know space or whatever and not naming that I'm there or like am I did this whole idea come from a book I read that I forgot and I think I came up with this idea (laughs) (laughs) Um, yes and you would never do anything if you Um, we're always stopped by that but it is good to have that consciousness of where some of your ideas come from right like okay so where this is taking me right now is into um one of the anxieties being that um expectation to originate the expectation to have like the big idea um and the way that that pressure affects the work we're doing. And then I want to put adjacent to that, the expectation of labor and productivity. Mm. Like doing a kind of work where some of your work is thinking, but then also being in a culture that condemns every non-productive moment. Anyways, so I guess my question is like- put that. That is such a great way to... There's my question. (laughs) What do we do? (laughs) I think at a practical level, one thing that I do do, it doesn't work all the time, but I constantly have to remind myself when I'm thinking, when I'm having those 
days sometimes where I just think about ideas or how to, mm-hmm. that this is part of the process that I, you are working on it. This is how you work. This is actually how you work. Yes. And this is part of the process. It's not lazy. It's not not working on it. This is part of the process and that, and it's valuable. Something I want to pull out from that, because like, absolutely, like, hallelujah and yes to it all. I want to pull out is that the earlier you are in your practice, the harder it is to to understand what kind of idleness will result in what it is that you want. Like you've done it before, so you can say, oh yeah, I remember last year I allowed myself to think for a day and I did finish that play. And the more times you've gone through that cycle, the less difficult it is to say, I'm allowed to do this because this is what I do. This works for me. And so like there's something in, for for folks who are earlier in practice, there's something in like maybe trying to actively identify what those things are that feel like idleness, but that you do every time. Or and that, men- yeah. mentorship would, sorry, sorry. Please. Yeah, uh, uh, mentorship would help with that, you know, like, um, um, having elders in your life um, that uh, that could get you hip to different ways of uh, being productive. Um, I, I think a big, uh, the thing that makes me uh, uh, sick in, in, in my stomach is, is, is because we're in this like unbalanced place and uh, the West, I love that euphemism. The West prides itself on being an individualistic society. You know, the the supremacy of the individual. It's their answer to racism, for example. What do you mean I don't see color? I'm looking for the individual. Like, who are you as an individual? Mm -hmm. Why would you uh, uh, link yourself as as a part of this group when, you know, we're an individualistic society? I had this Mm -hmm. phenomenal, my mentor, one of my mentors, um, her name is Roxanne Butterfly on, on the last episode I put on the podcast <clears throat> and I was asking her specifically about um, the uh, challenges of being uh, a woman, of being a mother, an artist in France. Talk to me. And she blew my mind with her response. One story that sunk me was she said that um, a friend of hers is currently in jail. Uh, she was raising um, a child with special needs uh, and that child uh, was, was, was an adult at this point, but uh, the, the, the mother had um, gone as far as she could. Um, she didn't have support and the government did a good job in terms of, you know, making sure everybody's well paid. But w- without without the community, without the support, uh, the the mother was at the end of her rope, and just wanted to end everything. And so, um, so uh, she said, you know, if if she knew that if she wasn't around, that her child would would be wouldn't be able to survive. So she killed her child. Attempted to kill herself, didn't do that successfully. And so now she's in jail. Um, And then Roxanne, at the end of that story, said to me, it's hard to have hope, right? Um, But it's, to me, what I heard in that story is something that's a consequence of being in an individualistic society. Every every man and woman for for themselves, everybody for themselves. It's it's like um, for that reason, I, I joke around or I'm flipping to earlier about saying, "Ah, oh, you're talking to a hippie." But I'm I'm I really believe that um, I need uh, my people around me. Uh, I need community. I currently 
I live in Brampton. I do not know my neighbors in Brampton. I know some of them. I know the pushy ones that, you know, the, the, but, uh, but I remember when I was growing up in Montreal, I, I did know my neighbors and um, there's, there's a balance that we have to strike that we've lost. Um, and so I think it's important for as many of us who have still have that imagination to take our power uh, our sense of agency in our own hands and try to create the world that we want to live in, be the change that we want to see in the world, because it's so attractive to sit down after a long day, crack open a buckle of something, light something else, and uh, be entertained by the latest thing on Netflix. Which I can't wait to do, by the way. I love doing that. I'm just saying balance. That's my point. Balance. Mm -hmm. Leah, where are you at? Um, yeah, I think I do think it's harder to I think it's hard to motivate oneself hmm. just generally we know that we just know that there's a whole um, there are whole industries that make billions of dollars off of people not knowing how to um make themselves do things that they should do as adults. So I think that's important to know that like no one is alone in the struggle to try to do the thing, mm -hmm. whatever that thing may be. Um, it's weird. I think it's, there's something in our nature that resists um, Sometimes I think it's fear, fear of doing the work, fear of the outcome of the work, fear of, you know, but I do think right now in this time when we are so apart, it's even harder. I think it's even harder, even for people, you know, there are lots of people who have really said that they thrive in this kind of landscape and doing more Zoom stuff. We know that it has opened things in terms of um, accessibility. And that being said, I still think it helps to be around other people who are doing the thing. Yeah. It just does. And that's something that I've really struggled with over the last couple of years um, because I didn't really think that I needed to be around that many people. But that's because I was always around so many people. Mm -hmm. so I really liked alone time. Like I got home, I was like, close the door, turn off the lights. I don't want to see my neighbor. I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> I didn't, I do know all their names though. I will say, but I was that person who I was like, I'm not going out after I've already been in rehearsal all day or around, you know, this all day or groups of people. Um, and then, yeah, during the pandemic, I realized, oh, oh, I need to be around people. I actually do like to be around people. Um, yeah, and it's so interesting too, like the, the one thing, so when the Rogers outage happened like last month mm -hmm. it was really interesting in the respect that 
number one, everyone realized, oh, I can't do anything right now. Literally nothing, literally mostly nothing. Even the games I was playing or even the, even the, the pastime things we were doing, we couldn't do. And the second thing that happened was then people got together. I saw all these pictures of just like people hanging out at, at coffee shops, like <laughs> in the street, my house, all of a sudden the patio was packed with people. People were just like outside talking to each other. And it just really stuck out to me because um, yeah, that's all. I don't even have like a huge takeaway there, but it was, it was just interesting to watch. It was very. If I can much- add to, yeah, go on. Go ahead. Well, the the because you started talking about it, it's it's hard to be motivated to do the thing, um, and uh, I, it resonates a lot with me. Um, um, for how old am I? Good. For uh, uh, most of my life, I believed in white supremacy. Believed in it. Card carrying member, um, and it wasn't until. I had like this breakdown in, in 2009 where I, I, my trajectory shifted and uh, the paradigm shifted to January, 2009. I was driving on the way to um, teach this horrible class. I am not a teacher, but I used to teach great um, tap dance. I used to teach tap dance. So um, uh, on my way to teach this horrible class, uh, miserable. And um, I turned on the radio and uh, they're they're playing uh, a speech from M- M- Dr. Martin Luther King. And for those of you who don't know, uh, listen to one of his speeches. You'll you'll understand that he uh, essentially was a jazz musician. Like the 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 way that he composed uh, his speeches, uh, and he he'd get into a specific rhythm, a groove. He'd find this hook. And and ride that hook. Just it's an it's an auditory wonder, a moral a moral wonder. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King. So um, January two thousand nine. He's he's recounting the story of um, he's giving a speech somewhere, and somebody rushes the stage and stabs him, and. He's rushed to the, the hospital and the doctor says, you're a lucky man, Mr. King, you're, you're a lucky man. If, if, uh, if that blade had, had just traveled like half an inch to the left, it would have um, punctured your major artery. You would have bled to death. And so here comes the hook. Um, he says, if I had but sneezed, I would not have led the march on Washington. And if I had but sneezed, I wouldn't have led the march uh, at the, the Montgomery boy, bus boycott. If I had but sneezed, I wouldn't have done this. That would. And the, 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 the impact of one person, and we know civil rights movement is not one person, but no. But the impact of, of this person's decision to show up every day or show up when he showed up, uh, it... Um, it changed, it changed uh, many lives. And so I started to ball. So I'm driving. I'm, I can't, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not crying. That's cute. Balling to the point where I can't see the world and very dangerous. But why am I crying? Why am I balling? Because uh, uh, January 2009, uh, Barack Obama is elected or inaugurated as uh, president of the United States. And I, realized that I never believed it was possible for a black person to be elected president of the United States. I didn't believe it was possible. So if I didn't believe it was possible for some excellent black person to be elected president, what did I believe was possible for myself? Um, I tell that story because uh, in terms of motivation, imagination, what I want to do, what I'm capable of doing, it, it, white supremacy up to that point really shaped how I was showing up in the world, where I thought I would be welcomed, what rooms were, were appropriate for me to show up in the world. Um, and white supremacy is just one cog that puts us in our place. Uh, 
I, I feel like the opportunity that we have every day um, is to uh, break down those, those uh, psychological systems that keep us in our place. Um, now, is that, is that the key to motivation? No, I'm just telling you a story that, that got me motivated to, to do other things. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, um, I see a lot of people staying in their place. The, the uproar that happened in 2020 uh, is proof of that. Um, I, 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 people were so moved. And two years later, I perceive people getting real comfortable going back to sleep. Don't rock the boat. I'm so comfortable. Um, but meanwhile, uh, people still need more than ever, always, actually, always and forever need help. And so I think, I don't know, I don't know how to answer this question about self-care, but I, I, I think about Angela Davis a lot. You know, there are certain people, certain luminaries that, oh boy, if I could just ask you one question, yo, mm -hmm. I think about Angela Davis a lot. How has she sustained herself doing the work for most of her life? Um, I should be so lucky uh, to, to live that long and, and work that much. Um, but but I suspect, oh. Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, but one of the things that I think about with a person like Angela Davis or these kind mm -hmm. of people who have, who have survived is when you say, how, how did she sustain herself doing the work for most of her life? I wonder, well, did she? Who says that Fantastic. there were times, oh. you know, in her life that were not sustainable, that yeah. almost broke her? I think it's important to think that way as well, mm -hmm. because we often do that to ourselves and others where we we take people and we put them on this vaulted thing and go like, there's the example of who, you know, I want to get to that end goal and this person is still alive and functional. So they must be, they must have done it well. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, um, MLK is a perfect example of a person that is hugely, you know, for good reason, obviously hugely um, revered and, co-opted i would say mm. and then when you really look into the last you know five years of his life he was a basket case he was living with an extreme amount of stress yes he kept going yes he did it anyway but there was a cost you know like when you hear his um, his friends talk about him who were still alive. He aged like 10 years and five years. He was paranoid. He could not talk to anybody because he was convinced and rightfully so. Like he wouldn't go see a therapist because he was convinced that the therapist was going to be bugged by the FBI. He was so scared. And so, and so I think I just think it's important to remember those things too, especially with mm. our heroes and sheroes, you know, mm. um, especially the black folk, because there's no way that they didn't come through it with some, some battle scars that maybe they're still um, dealing with today. I, I would assume. Yeah. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. It's also definitely worth like, thinking of it as a process or thinking of it as a lifelong endeavor and not a place that you get to and then you get to stay there. Like mm -hmm. being all right is not a place you arrive and stay. I have been not all right every day for 10 days. And the like showing up today was like, is it gonna happen? <laughs> I don't know, wait and see, how exciting. I might or might not make it. Um, and I think that there's something good in, oh, I want to tell you my story about my, my rehab this, this year, the rehab work that I did on my practice this year. It's connected to this. 
the end, I'm so sorry to Kimberly. <laughs> the end of that thought is that there's, there's definite value in knowing that there is purpose to the places that you choose to show up. It has been so hard sometimes to operate in spaces where I feel that I should be hmm. or have been made to feel that I should be, especially if the reason why I should be there is not clear to me, but someone has been very clear that I should definitely put myself in this place, that that, that is such depleting work sometimes. Okay, so may I tell you my rehab story? It's not rehab in the Please conventional do. sense. Thank you. So um, I do a lot of my own creative work I do a lot of um, like dramaturgy or other roles in the development of work of other folks. I love it. I love it a lot. Um, sometimes I do something called teaching, but you have to use the air quotes when I'm doing it. Um, and, I, and I'm active in the community in the ways that are important to me. And for me, there's a balance of those things I need to be doing. I'm allowed to spend all this energy on my own play because I've given to the community in this way. And I'm allowed to have this rest because I have offered someone respite in this other way. There's some weird balance of giving um, and doing in my, in my brain that makes me comfortable, like just sitting down and writing a play. It's not good. I'm working on it. So, um, at some point, I had just way too much work, as you know, cyclically, right? There's the overloaded moment, and then there's the like, ah, uh, like do my as best as I can for each of these things, and sometimes be not so thrilled with how I did, but get it all, get her done. Um, and I realized that I do not know, or I did not know, the difference between something I wanted to do and something I felt I had to do. I, when I said yes to something, I did not know which of those two things it was. And so I was unable to say no to anything in case my involvement was critical. Help me, Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. And as much as I would say to myself, you're not the only one, it's fine. Someone else can do that. Um, it didn't feel that way. So. Here's what I did for myself, because I did say I was going to talk a little bit about like what what you can do about it. Um, I decided to decline everything in the month of May, regardless who asked it, regardless what it was, what it paid and how much I wanted to do that particular thing. I decided for May I would say no to everything. It was a very hard thing to do. And and I did OK. I did pretty good for the first two weeks of May. So on May 15th, I decided I would begin to say no without giving a reason for why I'd said no. Oh, teach me, teach me, Obi-Wan. Guy, it was difficult because I realized in the first half of May that all the energy of saying no, and if anyone has waited for a no from me for a month, it's because I couldn't think of a reason that you would think was good enough, even though I had a reason that I thought was good enough. So I didn't know how to explain to you, I don't want to do this in a way that would not cause you to say, yeah, but dot, dot, dot. I don't want that. Um, unless that's a dynamic that we're in. If you're like certain people, if you're in this room now, you could probably call me and say, I feel like you're not seeing how this is good for you. And I would say, you know me and you know what I think is good for me. So I'll hear that. This is not that, right? This is just people going, yeah, but I want you to. And then sometimes there's like the things I do to myself, other people take upon themselves to do to me. But yeah, but think about like how, how important it would be for those kids. But think about like, if you don't do it, think about, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm Catholic. I'll, I'll do that. I don't need this in a voice outside my head as well. So on May 15th, I started saying, yeah, just no. Thanks for asking, no. And then on June 1st, I was like, that went really well. 
I'm going to own, I'm going to incrementally return. So in June, I'm going to say yes, if it's digital and I'm, and I don't need a reason why I want that. Whereas I would spend like weeks trying to figure out how to be like, sorry, it's, I'm in Hamilton, the commute, it's really kind of, and with the current, you know, the situation and the, it's just a little like, and thinking like, oh man, I'm just saying I'm a pussy. <laughs> That's what this says. I can't hit send on this. People are moving all over town. It's not valid that I can't do it. So anyways, that was my rehab. And then what happened was in June, I turned around uh, and I looked, I opened up my calendar well after my first coffee, Travis. Um, and I and I looked to see like, okay, what's my plan for today? What are my objectives? And I opened it and there was nothing. And there was nothing for weeks. And I started cranking out drafts. Everything that was overdue just got shredded. I was like, I give this one three days, which is not something you really tell yourself as a creator. You get for three days to think of nothing but this, right? Often you're like, you can have an hour. And then tomorrow, try to get back into that place for another hour. I was like, for three days, I don't care about anything but finishing this draft and I will hit send whatever it is. And then I would be like, next, what? And I ripped through things that I've been trying to develop for like two years. And because like of all sorts of different reasons, I couldn't get there. I couldn't get to the next idea. And there was just space. And I did that for myself. And now on June 1st, somebody asked me to do something. And I literally was like, yes, I will do that because I want to. Hmm. And I was like, yes, that's true. And I know that to be true. I think my actual my actual answer is to gamify everything though. Like anything that's a game. I won. I won that game by not saying yes to anything. Um I want to I'm sorry, I'm sorry. How did you come to the to the amazing uh how did you come to the idea of a the May fast? How did that arise for you? Um I think I sat down with like, like I didn't want to go to my desk, right? And I was like, how come I don't want to be there? There's something there that's like, hmm. I don't want to do it. And what I didn't want to do was say no to a bunch of things and and give everybody a reason. Like I had to say no to some things because I was too sad. That's none of your business. So I didn't know what else to tell them. I didn't know how to tell them I'm too sad to do your thing. Um, and I realized that it's my right to not want to, and that I was valuing everybody's needs over my own. And then I sort of did the math on that, which meant that the places where I really wanted to show up, where I wanted to be present, were not getting the best of me. Hmm. So ultimately, I was not achieving what I choose to be invested in. You know, so it was like, okay, what is it's sort of circling back to, you know, the idea from the beginning of self care as a strategy for community care. So I wanted to show up in a better way for folks that I was like, oh, I want you to have all of me. I want to be fully in the room. When I'm with you, I don't want to be thinking, how can I make it to the next thing? I just want to be with you. Yeah. And that, that all my collaborators like deserve that. So, like, how is that possible? I used to, and I still do have a philosophy of like, when I'm in a room that I don't have a choice but to be in. So like, I've, I've agreed to do a project. When I get there, what they want from me is like, that's not good for me, you know, but I feel committed to follow it through. I have a philosophy of like, find what, what I'm here to learn. And that has been, that has gotten me through some of just the sufferingest gigs, honestly. Mm -hmm. But I realized that like, like, I, I, don't, I don't know how to say it. Like, I'm somebody. I don't need to be in that position, you know? And I wish everybody didn't need to be in that position, but I can walk out of any room I don't want to be in. So why am I acting like that's not the case? Hmm. And if anybody feels like they're not able to walk out of a room that they're in, and I'm in that room, and they're like, hey, I really can't be here. This is harming me. Like, let's both walk out then, you know? Like, I would do my best to make that possible for other people. 
but it doesn't help those people that I withhold from myself the right to work in places that do not drain me, that yeah. nurture me, that give me joy because I'm contributing to something, even when I'm in a room where the story is dark or the, the material is dark, that I'm, I feel fulfilled that I'm contributing um, and that I'm in community with people who care deeply about something I care deeply about. Um, as, as opposed to when I'm in a room and eventually someone goes like, and then Donna will wrap something, Donna make something up. Like, that's not fun for me. I hate that room. Well, it, it's really what you're talking about is boundaries. Mm -hmm. You've Oh, no, is that what that is? Yeah. And I, I think um, as artists, generally, most artists are very bad with work boundaries because we're programmed to feel very grateful for work, just any kind of work. Thank, thank the Lord you're calling. Uh, yes, I'll do. Yes. I'll, you know, that's what we're kind of programmed to do, especially when we start out, you're programmed to just say yes to everything, get it on your resume, meet more people, yes. you know? And, and I think that is so harmful especially to young artists, mm -hmm. because now being experienced artists, I'm not going to say old, I'll say experienced, <laughs> now being experienced artists, I think we, all three of us can say that there were situations or rooms or jobs that you took because of that mentality that were harmful. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think what I've learned is I'm very bad at saying, of giving the no excuse. I will say that I'm very bad. Like I do spend time crafting emails like with long excuses. I don't know why, but I'm much better at saying no. And I'm really good at quitting. And I would encourage people to... Oh, I think we you have Travis. inspired Travis <laughs> to quit. <laughs> yeah, Travis was like, "Well, let's that. try it right no, now." Sister. Um, Sorry, I'm 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 moving locations. I'm I'm here and present listening. Oh, no worries, no worries, no worries. <laughs> we were just like, "Wow, um, great timing." Um, but so just to expand on that. You're going to take jobs that you think are going to sustain you, fulfill you, that don't. Mm -hmm. You might realize that immediately. You may realize that six months down the road. And I think as artists, the other thing we're told is that now we're in this art making. We're now a part of a whole, a cog in a machine, whatever you want to say, whatever part you're playing and that you can't leave because then the whole thing falls apart and the whole piece suffers and the art doesn't get made. That's not true. Mm. And so I would encourage people that if you say yes and then it turns sour, to get out and quit and that's fine other people in other professions quit all the time and he's back <laughs> and so that has been very freeing to me I will admit because I was a person who also said yes to everything also found it hard to say no to the thing and then got in situations where I didn't want to be there anymore, but I was like, well, I said, yes. And my dad told me, if you make a commitment, you have to follow through and see it to the end and like all of that. And I have a, a friend of mine who is a, a musician. His name's Andrew Penner. I'm, I'm naming him. So everyone knows where it comes from. Andrew. Yeah. He's a, he's a musician around town, does a lot of theater. And like a very long time ago, I was telling him about some, 
project I was working on. And I'm like, this is happening. This I'm so stressed out and this, 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 this. And he said, so just quit. <laughs> and that was a revelation. He said, I, I've quit job. I mean, you can quit a job. It's just a job. You can find another job. I think that that's definitely one of the, one of the anxieties is um, I'll never work again, you know, or like if I say no to this thing, or if I leave this thing, that will be my reputation. And like, I just want to say one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you about this, Leah, is because Leah says no to me all the time. <laughs> Time. so much i never stop asking because lee is great and there's but no also, hard I'm feelings comfortable. i'm very comfortable like i've known you for years so I, you're a person that i can I feel the irony is that i feel i can say no to you because you are my friend and i feel like understand usually with strangers that's where it's harder because mm -hmm. i'm like i don't know them they might you know, but uh, I think I don't care anymore because it's it, the things that you've told yourself about, well, maybe I'll never get hired again are not true. The art community generally is quite small, especially in Canada. If you are good at what you do and generally a, a, a pleasant person to work with, you'll get rehired. You can leave a job and leave well. Yeah. Even if you're in the middle of it, you can leave well. I love that we're on a carpool with Travis. I like right it now. so much. I'm, I love it so much. I feel like I'm, I love it. Um, hello to the car. Hello, car. Um, <laughs> What up? I don't know. Can you hear everyone, or I don't know what's the deal. Yeah, we love okay, it. Okay, so this is now a group a group chat. So, uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, just just to add to to what you just said in terms of the the anxiety of of saying you no. Know, as a tap dancer, I know full well ain't nobody looking for a tap dancer. So, like when when I get a call, I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> I'm working. We working. We can eat. It's 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 it, the the anxiety is real. Uh, but having said that. <clears throat> Um, I told you like a, a long story uh, a little while ago about being in the car um, headed to this horrible gig teaching. Uh, it took me a very long time to say no to teaching. It took me a very long time. Uh, and uh, like to, to actually make a full on commitment to being who I feel I am in my heart, which is a performing artist. And, and so um, I say that to say, uh, you know, to my podcast, my podcast is really just a shameless way of getting advice from people that I admire, right? Uh, and uh, there's this there's, there's one wonderful dancer, phenomenal tap dancer, uh, said, "Nope, I, I respect. You know, you're, you're 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 doing your thing, and you want you want to be uh, uh, solely a, a performing artist. I my my advice to you is I should always say yes and listen." At this point, I'm too old for that. You know, it's too painful. It's too painful to do anything that I don't want to do. Yeah. They know they, there's not enough time in the day, in a month, in a year, in this life to do anything that I, I don't want to do or that I don't feel is contributing something uh, mm -hmm. to Amen. what I feel I, I'm, I'm called to do. Uh, so circling back, a part of, a big part of my own personal self-care is that wonderful word. No. And if you want to real feel real good, hell no. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, I feel like, oh man, I have so many things in my brain, but um, I would love to do this another time with y'all because I think there's like, more. yeah, yeah, it's good. Everything's like, I feel like it's going to be all right. I was right to be excited to be here today. Um, all right, I feel like there, I have a lot that I want to go away and think deeply about. There's something that Leah was saying that really struck me about 
working with and against like something that is internalized with things that are inside of us. Okay, I can make that thought more clear another time. I feel like um, I would love to ask you for you to answer one of two takeaway questions. So one is for yourself, what is a way that you get in your own way that you can stop doing? <laughs> That's right. Easy questions saved for the end. And two, what is a simple act of sustaining that you recommend to people, like a way of getting through? I can go. Or go for Travis, it. Do. yeah. Okay, so I think the what do I do to get in my own way that I can stop doing? Um, the it's the quest for perfection. But my perfection is very specific of I actually don't care about being perfect for me. I need to present as perfect to other people. So I'm like, I have to hand this in, like make sure the margins are right. And I'll like spell check it 400 times or whatever the thing is. Like, it's usually about fonts actually. And um, letting that go, just letting it go. Because now working in, going from being in theater to being in media where there are people who work with insane deadlines and turnover mm -hmm. and seeing these people that I'm like, Oh, this person has like all these degrees been around the world. And then looking at the stuff that they hand in, I'm like, Oh, well there, this looks like a mess. Like the <laughs> thoughts, good, but this is a, this is a mess, but it's just the beginning and that's fine. And if I could do that, I would save myself so much time. So that's one of the big things that I'm trying to let go is like presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm talking more in writing, but like I have a, that waste so much time and I procrastinate about that all the time. And the, the, I think the easiest way to sustain oneself is to go outside. Just Challenge. go outside. You don't have to do anything. I'm not saying that you have to like hike or go outside, take a couple of deep breaths. Don't look at your phone. Don't, just look at the sky for a couple of minutes. Okay. I just took a deep breath. Um, I'm working with the uh, other. I'm working with someone that's uh, uh, becoming very uh, important in my life. A mentor, in fact, uh, they're challenging me in ways that make me really, 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 really uncomfortable. <clears throat> uh, they describe me as uh, being one of the most fearful people uh, they've ever met. Oh. And that, uh, I think that description sums up how I feel, you know, uh, uh, you know, on a cloudy day, on a clear day, it's something different, but uh, I think, I think the fear uh, creates delusions in my perspective, uh, the fear stops me in my tracks, the fear makes me depressed, the fear makes me want to go uh, dig a hole somewhere, uh, uh, the fear is, the fear feels very, uh, and uh, I actually don't know how to not, 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 not. But I think that's where I rely on concepts like courage to fight through. And uh, the things that have been giving me courage. Yeah. But frankly, our stories, our stories is how I work, it's how I work. I want to introduce you, if I can, this right here, that's I, I, texting. He's on, he's on Twitter right now. Uh, that's Jonathan Morin. Um, I, I get the 
and, and his wonderful partner in crime, Corey. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's my wife, Tanya. What's going on? What's going on? Uh, where I'm, I'm not alone. <laughs> I'm, I'm with very uh, capable, overly competent people. The, the journey that uh, Jonathan is allowing me to uh, witness is giving me courage because I'm not sure that I would have the courage to do the same. So I guess the, you know, the, the advice that I would give you to listen to your son um i i want to add a way of i had that whole time to think and imagine what did i do with it i was listening intently um getting out of my own way or not being my own worst enemy. I think something I can do is name the reason I've made my choice. So like, I'm going to do this because I want to because of this aspect of it so that I don't waste any more energy doubting if I was right to make this choice so that I can make a choice and just move through it and be like, I made that choice for a reason that I stand behind. So I think naming that for myself will help me not spend the first third of any contract going why did they hire me do they not know what i'm like um so i can also add to that i'm doing this for this reason and this is what i'm bringing to it little 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 good self-talk will get me out of my own way i hope i hope um something for other folks is Like, I guess, I guess to know what you're centering in any given moment. Like, if I want to I wanna contribute to a movement and then I have, like, anxiety that my shoes are too expensive to, to wear to a protest or that's a literal thing, you know, like, that's not a good look or whatever, then um, I'm addressing the wrong center. Um, that That is a valid thing to, to think about but not at the expense of showing up for the movement. So that's so to know when you're when you are the center of your consideration, sit with yourself and sort that out. Um, and when you're choosing to to focus on a movement or a project or uh, or people that you're choosing, you know, to to work with, um, let that be the guide of uh, what needs to happen next. Like, Sometimes your discomfort is okay. Sometimes your discomfort is productive um, when we engage in a conscious way. Y'all, that was a lot. And it was plenty. And I want to thank you so much. Thank you so much, Donna. I'm so glad I said yes to this. This was a good one to say yes to. Good yes. I always want to be your best yes. To hear Travis. Travis, it was great to hear you just talk on things. Brought the skunk. Um, to me too. Uh, we'll make it happen. We'll do this again. Um, quick before we sign off, I want to let y'all know that um, there's another session uh, tonight at seven o'clock. You can um, check out details at justiceforum.ca. This work is made possible by all of our many partners, but especially Canada Council for the Arts for this particular iteration of the Community Justice Forum, which is uh, part of a larger public research vehicle uh, informing our production of the first stone, which opens at Buddies and Bad Times in October. It has been a decade. We've been working on it for a long time and it's good to go. It's been so long. So long. So like I'm since excited. we met. Since we met, yeah. Yeah. Literally. So this is the one, y'all. Um, let's do it, prove it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Heather and Max. Thank you, Marcia and Kimberly. Uh, thanks, Chris. Alvarez, I see you. Um, and to everyone uh, joining us out on YouTube, see you at the next thing. Later, skaters. Ha, <laughs>